In this lecture, we're going to look at the integumentary system. Now, the integumentary system consists of your skin, your hair, nails, and glands. And its function is protection, basically protection from the environment, uh, protection from infection. Your skin is the first line of defense against infection and um, protection from heat, from cold, from dehydration. There's a lot of things that the skin protects from. This is why it's so serious when anything disrupts the skin and especially uh, something like, um, you know, a severe burn, for instance. These are all things that have to be addressed with that patient while they're recovering from that burn. Um, also, function is going to be sensation. You've got light touch, deep touch, pain, vibration. All of those receptors are going to be found within the skin. Also, temperature regulation. As you overheat, there's a couple of things that happen. Uh, one, the sweat glands are going to uh, secrete uh, perspiration. That perspiration, hopefully, if you're not in a humid environment, will evaporate away and give you this evaporative cooling effect. The other thing it does is uh, there are a lot of capillaries within uh, the dermis portion of the skin. And those capillaries are going to dilate to allow heat to dissipate away from the surface of the skin. And the opposite is true as far as uh, if, if you're too cold, the first thing that happens is uh, the blood vessels will dilate to try to heat up the skin. But if you continue to get cold and your core temperature gets cold, well, those blood vessels can constrict down to maintain body heat. And this is what can lead then to frostbite. The skin also produces vitamin D. And vitamin D is necessary for calcium absorption. And then we have excretion. We excrete um, oils from the sebaceous glands. We excrete sweat. We excrete some toxins sometimes from the skin. And um, so those are basically the functions of the skin. Now we're going to start at the bottom and work our way up. And you can see here we have the hypodermis. The skin rests on this, but it's, it's not part of the skin. It's part of the integumentary system, but not really part of the skin. It's going to consist of loose connective tissue. The types of cells we find are fibroblasts, adipose cells, macrophages, and we also have a couple of other names for the hypodermis. It's also called the subcutaneous tissue, or in the hospital we just say sub-Q, like you're going to give a sub-Q injection. What do you give a sub-Q injection with? A hypodermic needle. And uh, in anatomy, we call this superficial fascia because when we slice the skin and start to peel it away from the cadaver, then we see that hypodermis, but it's, it's just a lot of fibers and fat and things like that. We call it superficial fascia, and that's what we typically scrape away so that we can see the underlying structures. Now the skin itself is going to be made up of the dermis and epidermis, again going from bottom up. So the dermis, as you see here, gives the skin structural strength. It's going to create what are called cleavage lines, which I'll show you what that is in just a moment. And there are two layers. There is going to be a reticular layer and a papillary layer. Now, papilla uh, means finger-like projections. So if we look over here, see these finger-like projections? Three-dimensionally, this would look like, an, like one of those egg crate foam um, mattress covers. Okay, so that is the papillary layer right across here. The rest is going to be the reticular layer. Okay. 
Now, talking about the cleavage lines, let's go forward here. Uh, cleavage or tension lines. Now, elastin and collagen fibers are oriented in some directions more than others. And this is going to be important, especially in surgery, because, of, because if an incision is parallel to the lines, like we see here, there's going to be less gapping, faster healing, and less scar tissue. If we go across those lines, then we've got all this elastic uh, tissue pulling away, and also the, the collagen pulling away from uh, that cut, and it causes it to gap. Okay, And if it gaps, then the body has to try to fill in these gaps, and it's going to do that with scar tissue. So you're more likely to get scar tissue because of this. Uh, and if this were on the face, instead of one, two, three, four, five, six, instead of six sutures, they would come in with super, super fine sutures, and they'd probably do more like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, more like seventeen sutures right here, just to make sure you close all of those little gaps and prevent scar formation. Okay, going back, um, the epidermis itself, which is the top layer, is an epithelial tissue. Now the dermis is made up mostly of connective tissue. So going back up to the epidermis, again, it's going to be stratified squamous epithelium. Okay, stratified squamous epithelium. And we're going to look at these different layers. It is stratified. So we have layers or strata, and we're going to have names for these different strata. And we're going to look at that just a little bit later. Now, the one thing about the epidermis, just like with um, any um, um, epithelial tissue, it's going to be avascular. So there's no blood supply. So if we take a look at this, there's no blood supply. So how does it get its nutrients? It gets it from the dermis. So basically through diffusion. And the reason we have all these papilla is to increase surface area. So, you know, these lower layers here are going to be able to get the nutrients and uh, get the oxygen it needs. The layers above this start to die off till we get to the top. And this is all dead skin, basically. And as I showed you, or as I mentioned, I should say, uh, the um, dermal papilla kind of looks like one of those egg crate foams. And the epidermis, um, well, when you peel that away, it almost looks like a thinner egg crate foam just kind of set on top of this one. Again, this is going to increase surface area. When we look at the dermis and epidermis under the, the microscope, we see this little layer right here is going to be the epidermis. All of this is going to be the dermis. Remember, we have a papillary layer. See the little papilla? So that's the papillary layer. And the rest is the reticular layer of the dermis. Now, if we go closer with the microscope um, to the epidermis, then we're going to be able to see the different strata or layers. Okay. And um, the top layer here is the stratum corneum. This is cornified tissue, which means these are basically dead skin cells. Uh, they're going to just be basically dried up pieces of keratin protein. Okay. Then we have the stratum lucidum. Lucid means clear. Like if you have lucid thought, you have clear thoughts. Okay, so that is the stratum lucidum. Then we have the grainy layer or stratum granulosum. Then we have the spiny layer or stratum spinosum. And then finally, this one cell layer thick layer is going to be the stratum 
basal, the stratum basal. And so how do we tell these apart? Well, we're going to look for color and texture changes. Like here's one color and texture. We go down till we see a change and here's the next change. So we know because we've memorized this in order, we would know that this is the stratum lucidum. Then we look for the next color in texture change, and that would be right here. So we know that's the granulosum. Then we look for our next, well, here's what I do. The stratum basal, we know is only one cell layer thick. Okay, so one cell layer thick. So in between this and this is going to be our stratum spinosum. And it kind of looks like if someone were drawing this or doing a pastel with this, it looks like they've kind of smeared it a little bit and blended it. So it's a totally different color and texture change. Below that, well, now we're into the dermis. So here's a dermal papilla. Now, why the dermal papilla uh, are important besides increasing surface area? They also create something called epidermal ridges. This is important. Epidermal ridges are your fingerprints. This is why you can't just sand off your fingerprints. Um, you'd, you'd be kind of a bloody mess um, by the time you got down to the dermis here. So, but um, uh, it doesn't matter how much skin, you know, the epidermis comes off the fingerprints will come back because they're created by these dermal papilla. Okay. So again, epidermal ridges created by dermal papilla. Now epidermal cells, there are different cell types within uh, the epidermis. We have keratinocytes, which produce keratin for strength. Keratin is the protein that your skin is made of. Your hair is keratin. Your fingernails and toenails are keratin. The horns on a bull is keratin. <laughs> okay, so um, it's a pretty tough substance. Melanocytes are what contribute to skin color. It's what gives you your base color. Mm -hmm. There's other things that add to color, but um, that's what uh, gives you your base color. And then we have these Langerhan cells, which are part of the immune system. And then Merkel cells, they detect light, touch, and pressure. Now, the term to desquamate means older cells slough off. And we are constantly sloughing off old cells. As a matter of fact, um, it's said that as your mattress gets older, it gets heavier because of the collection of all these uh, dead skin cells. And then keratinization is uh, the cells die and produce our outer layer that resist abrasion and forms a permeability layer. So the reason we have these, um, these skin cells, these um, keratinized cells on the outside, it's for two reasons. One, for abrasion resistance, okay, like it says here, and forms a permeability layer, which means it's going to keep some things out Okay, and hold some things in, like moisture. Um, okay, so that's two things. But there's actually a third thing as well. What is it that collects on our skin? Well, why do we have to wash our hands? Well, we get things like bacteria, viruses, um, parasites, things like that live on the skin as well. Okay, the bacteria especially lives on the skin. Well, as you can imagine, they're going to build up in, you know, quite large numbers. So, you know, with the skin sloughing off, that's going to reduce some of the bacteria 
that's building up on the skin. And by the way, what does sloughed off skin become? Dust. Where do we find bacteria? Primarily on dust. Dust is flying around through the air. Uh, this is why anything exposed to the air can become contaminated with bacteria. Okay, reviewing the layers again, we have a stratum corneum, and that's the most superficial layer, and consists of, again, cornified cells. These cells are dried up, uh, basically, um, keratin. And then we have the stratum lucidum, which is the thin, clear zone. Remember I said lucid means clear, like clear thought. Um, so lucidum is the clear zone. And it's not going to be clear when we look at it under the microscope, just like the picture I showed you earlier. That's because we're putting a stain on it. Okay, so the stain is going to give it some color, but naturally it would be a, a clear layer. Stratum granulosum in the superficial layers, nuclei and other organelles are beginning to degenerate and the cell dies. So again, it gives it that grainy appearance. Stratum spinosum, or the spiny layer, we have some limited cell division going on here because they're being pushed up um, by the stratum basal. And the stratum basal is the deepest portion of epidermis and is a single layer. That's the important thing to remember. There's high mitotic activity there, and the cells become keratinized there. So, again, this is where cell division is taking place. And that's why some of those cells, as they're dividing, they just get shoved up to the next layer, um, you know, as other cells uh, that are dividing take its place. Um, because, again, stratum basal is just that one single layer. So if you're still dividing and everything and you get shoved up a little bit, you're out of the stratum basal, you're in the stratum spinosum. There's some limited cell division there. Eventually the cells start to die off and break down. That's the stratum granulosum. Uh, as they get compressed, um, like on the bottom of your feet or palms of your hands, it produces that stratum uh, lucidum and then uh, begins to flake apart and that's the stratum corneum. Looking at this cartoon, we see the stratum corneum with the dead keratinocytes, stratum lucidum, the stratum granulosum, the grainy layer, the spiny layer, stratum spinosum, and then stratum basal, the single layer. Now, an old term that we used to use uh, when I first learned this and uh, first started teaching this was germanitivum or germanitivum, however you'd like to pronounce it. Um, so what does that mean, germanitivum? If you take a seed and you plant it, what do you hope that seed does? You hope it germinates. Okay, what's another name for bacteria? germs. Okay, well, so what does this, this term mean? Uh, germination or germs. Well, what do bacteria like to do? They like to divide. Okay, I don't know if they like it, but that's what they do. That's what they're good at. They're, there's constant cell division taking place there. Okay, making large numbers. When you plant a, a seed and you water it, it breaks out of dormancy, and how does it start to germinate or grow? The cells start to divide. So that's why we used to call this the stratum germinativum, because these, this was the germative layer, okay? Because these cells would divide, okay? But now we call it basal, which is a little easier to remember and spell. Okay, now I promised that I would help you all the different layers, how to memorize the different layers. So let's take a look. And here's a fun way of learning the layers of the epidermis. 
as found in thick skin. But first, we're going to need a little mnemonic. And that mnemonic is crying little girls spray boogers. Yes, I said boogers. And so for the first layer, the C stands for corneum, the L for little is lucidum, the G for girls is granulosum, the S for spray is spinosum, and the B for boogers is basil. And so in the cartoon that we just did a second ago on how to learn all the layers of the thick skin, well, that means that thin skin must be a little bit different. And it is. It's actually missing a layer. So thick skin is going to have all five of those epithelial layers. And again, it's going to be found in the areas that are subject to pressure or friction. And that's going to be the palms of the hands, the fingertips, and the soles of the feet. Thin skin is a lot more flexible. So as I said, it's missing one of the layers. It's missing the stratum lucidum. And thin skin is going to cover the rest of the body. Typically, if you see any kind of hair or hair follicles growing um, on, a, on a slide, a tissue slide, that is going to be thin skin. Thick skin usually does not have hair growing. Okay, so again, thick skin is going to have all five layers. Thin skin is just going to be missing the stratum lucidum. So what is it that uh, determines skin color? There's three main factors that determine skin color. There's pigments. Um, I mentioned melanin. Actually, I mentioned melanocytes, I believe. But melanin is the main pigment uh, made by melanocytes. And um, that provides for protection against ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light is very damaging to cells that are dividing. And remember the stratum basal? Um, that's where the cells are dividing. The ultraviolet light can hit the DNA of those dividing cells because they're, they're kind of vulnerable at that point. And it can actually create what's called a dimer, which means the DNA kind of forms a loop. Well, that's going to change the coding of that, um, that strand of DNA. It would be like if you took... Um, I don't know, a page out of a book and folded the page over, you know, and then back on itself again, put a little loop in the page and then try to read that sentence. That sentence is not going to be the same. Okay. So um, we need to protect that layer and we're going to give it some, some kind of sunscreening, some uh, shade. And how we do that is by producing the melanin. The melanin gets produced by the melanocyte and it gets put into the cells at the basal layer there. And um, again, that's going to protect um, and shade those lower cells and protect them from the ultraviolet radiation. And this is why the more you're in the sun, the darker the skin will get, typically, um, because it's trying to shade out and protect those uh, cells. Albinism is going to be the deficiency or absence of pigment. And, and that can be dangerous because there's no protection from the ultraviolet radiation. So that can cause a lot of skin damage and skin cancers. Also, the eyes tend to look pink because of the lack of pigment and cataracts and blindness can be a result of, um, of that lack of pigment, especially when exposed to that ultraviolet light. Now, another thing that can add color to the skin is going to be um, the pigment carotene. 
Now it says it's a yellow pigment, but we typically think of it being more orange because we find carotene in carrots. So, you know, in the form of beta carotene. And that carotene, that beta carotene, is converted into um, vitamin A. The other thing that can contribute to skin color is blood circulating through the skin. It's going to impart a reddish hue and it increases during blushing, anger, or inflammation. If you've ever noticed somebody who's about to pass out, a lot of times the blood kind of rushes out of the skin and causes the skin to look kind of ashen. It doesn't look healthy. Okay, so good circulation to the skin makes the skin look nice and healthy. In patients that uh, are deprived of oxygen, there will be a bluing of the skin called cyanosis. And um, that's hard, going to be harder to tell in darker skinned individuals. So if you have patients uh, that are darker skinned, you have to pay more attention because you may not notice the signs of cyanosis, which means that the, that patient is going to need oxygen. Um, the best way to check is like uh, looking at the membranes, you know, the conjunctiva of the eye, you know, pulling the eyelid down and looking um, inside the lip. Um, sometimes, you know, as long as there's no nail polish on, you can see sometimes the nail beds um, might give that uh, appearance. But that bluing, again, is because of lack of oxygen. Also, another thing that can contribute to skin color is the thickness of the stratum corneum. If you ever had dry, flaky skin, you notice that that area of the skin might look a little more ashen. And here, again, as um, you overheat, or if the skin gets cold, these blood vessels will dilate uh, to allow uh, heat loss to take place, but it's also going to cause redness of the skin, typically. And again, that'll be seen um, uh, much more in lighter skinned individuals. Um, and then we have these um, precapillary sphincters here that will constrict and relax to regulate the amount of blood flow going to the skin. And then melanin is produced in the epidermis by melanocytes. Again, site is cell. Melano, well, melanin is the pigment, so melanocyte is the cell that makes melanin. We all have the same number of melanocytes. What differs, however, is the amount of pigment produced and the color of that pigment. And that pigment uh, varies from yellow to tan to black in color. And melanocytes convert the amino acid tyrosine to melanin. And again, ultraviolet light will increase melanin production. So you can see this melanocyte here, um, and it's putting melanin into um, the, the skin and pigmenting that skin. Okay. Now, one thing about this melanocyte is it's very invasive looking, isn't it? Well, what's the malignant version of a melanocyte? Well, that would be a melanoma. And you can see how a normal melanocyte looks pretty invasive. This is why malignant melanoma can be very invasive. And typically when they remove uh, something that they think is probably a melanoma, they're going to go very wide and very deep around it to make sure that they get all of these little fingers. Okay, and so here we have a 90-year-old uh, person and a 62-year-old person. Of course, this is the 62-year-old and this is the 91. Wait, what? No, this is the 91-year-old person. So this is 91-year-old Japanese monk. He spent most of his life indoors. And this 62-year-old Native woman, uh, Native American woman, 
has spent most of her life outdoors and you can see the ultraviolet damage. Okay, I'm 62 at the time of this taping and um, and I'm starting to see uh, some of the, the damage from the skin. Now my father, when he was my age, um, his he had a lot more damage because he was a rougher. And so he was out in the environment constantly. So it had a much greater effect, negative effect, on his skin. Um, me, I'm outside not as much, but I still see some of the negative effects. And I do have some uh, skin damage because of it. And so you want to keep that in mind. Uh, the more ultraviolet exposure you get, the more the skin can be damaged. And then looking at accessory structures of the skin, that's going to be the hair, the glands, and the nails. And hair is going to be found everywhere on the human body except the palms, the soles, the lips, the nipples, parts of the external genitalia, and distal segments of your fingers and toes. And then glands, we've got a few different glands here. We have sebaceous glands, which are the oil glands. We have sudoriferous glands, or sweat glands. And we have a couple of types of those. And then we have ceruminous glands. What the heck is a ceruminous gland? Well, cerumen is earwax. So we find the ceruminous glands in the uh, auditory canal of the ear. And then mammary glands are a modified sweat gland, and of course they make milk. And then the nails, as I mentioned, are going to be made of keratin, uh, keratin protein. Very strong, very tough. And of course we use our nails for a lot of different things, for picking up stuff, for scratching. Um, uh, a lot of animals use the nails for tearing apart food, for catching and killing food. Um, for protection. Okay, our nails basically just help us to pick things up and um, help us to scratch. Now, hair structure. Hair is composed of a shaft and a root. The shaft protrudes above the skin. So, um, here is the shaft. Okay, the root is everything below this. And then the root forms a hair bulb. Okay, a lot of times you think, okay, this is the root, this hair bulb. But in reality, all of this is the root up to here, and then this is the hair shaft. Okay. And the hair is going to have three concentric layers. The medulla is the middle layer, so it's the central axis. It tends to be clear. The cortex forms the bulk of the hair, so that's the middle layer. That's where pigment is going to be found, so that's what determines your hair color. And then the cuticle is the surface, and that's going to be very scaly looking. Okay, so it looks like scales or shingles. Okay, that's why if you take your hair and uh, hold it out with one hand and then pinch it up towards your scalp and then run your fingers away from your scalp across that strand of hair, it's going to feel very smooth. That's because you're going with those scales. If you do that again and go the opposite direction, the hair is going to bunch all up and that's because you're going against those scales. So again, here is the medulla, here's the cortex, here is the cuticle. Now, one thing about the cortex, if you begin to produce less pigment, and as light shines through the hair, um, it's going to reflect off of that medulla and give a gray or silver appearance. So that's where gray hair comes from. Lack of pigment, so diminished pigment, and reflection off of the medulla. 
Now, what is it that makes uh, hair textures? Well, hair texture is going to be determined by the shape of the follicle. Okay, and so here's the follicle. Again, you can kind of see the follicle here. That's what the hair is growing through. Okay, here's a cross section. So here's our hair. The rest of this is follicle. And the follicle is made up of an internal epithelial root sheath, an external epithelial root sheath, and a dermal root sheath. Okay, so that's what makes up the hair follicle. The texture of the hair is going to be created by the shape of the follicle. If the follicle is very round, you're going to get very straight hair. If the follicle is oval, you're going to get more wavy hair. And if the hair follicle is flat, you're going to get extremely curly hair. So let's look at some of the parts. Here we have a dermal papilla coming up. We have um, the matrix, which is the growth zone of the hair. Okay. We have um, the melanocytes in here, which is going to give the hair its base color. Looking at this part of the hair, we have the sebaceous gland. Again, that's the oil gland. And um, we also have a muscle. Remember in an earlier uh, lecture, I mentioned that um, the hair has its own smooth muscle. It's called the erector pili muscle. Erector pili. So as the erector pili muscle contracts, it's going to cause the hair to kind of stand up. Uh, now, we're not as hairy as most critters, so we typically just get goosebumps from it. Okay, so goosebumps. And I guess there's other names for that. Chicken skin, things like that. Um, for most animals, though, most mammals, they have a lot more hair than we do. And they rely on uh, this erector pili muscle for a few different things. One, um, when it's cold out, it'll help to raise the hair up a little bit and create air pockets to to trap and warm air. Okay. Um, if you scare an animal, think about a cat, for instance. You scare a cat, the hair stands up on end and it makes the animal look a lot bigger and meaner. And in the case of cats, it works. I stay away. Okay. So um, that's kind of the function in animals. For us, um, the only real function it does besides giving us goosebumps is if you notice it's right near a sebaceous gland so when it contracts it'll squeeze that gland and help force some of the oil out through the the shaft here or out through I'm sorry the the uh, follicle along the hair and out onto the shaft and then that oil is then um, spread out onto the surface of the skin giving it some protection. Okay, hair growth, color and muscles. Hair growth, it runs in cycles. There's growth and resting. And then there's permanent hair loss, which is uh, pattern balding uh, is the most common, especially male pattern balding. And then hair color uh, is caused by varying amounts and types of melanin. And then again, the muscle, the erector pili muscle, it contracts the cause the hair to stand on end, giving you goosebumps. And it also helps to push some of the oil out onto the surface of the skin. Okay, so oil and sweat glands. Sebaceous glands produce sebum. Sebum is the oil. It oils the hair and skin surface. Again, helps to protect it, helps to provide kind of a, a permeability layer to kind of hold water in, helps to keep bacteria and dirt and things like that out. Um, the types of gland uh, that we have are, well, 
we also have um, sudoriferous glands, which are our sweat glands, and they can be the merocrine or eccrine type, and that's going to be the most common, and that's found in the palms and soles. And uh, again, that's going to give you the watery sweat. We kind of mentioned this before. And then we also have the apocrine, or like I call it, apocrine. Because again, if your roll-on rolls off your right guard's wrong, you smell like an ape. And that's going to be found in the axilla, which is your armpits, genitalia, and what's that planet near Neptune? Oh yes, Uranus. And so, again, this is going to create that smelly sweat. And looking at uh, those structures, the um, merocrine or eccrine sweat gland, which gives you the watery sweat, is going to be found more in the dermis. And it's going to put the sweat out onto the surface of the skin. The apocrine is going to put its secretions out onto the into the hair follicle where it rides along with the hair and goes out to the surface of the skin. So again the apocrine it's farther down more in the hypodermis puts its secretion into the hair follicle and then out onto the skin. Merocrine or eccrine to the surface of the skin. Nails, the anatomy of the nail, uh, the nail root is proximal. So we can see the nail root here. The nail body is distal. And then we have the eponychium or cuticle, uh, which is right here. And some other things, we have the free edge. We have the nail groove. If we do a cross section, actually more of a longitudinal section here. Here's the cross section. Longitudinal section, we have the nail matrix. This is where the nail grows from. Um, we have the lunula, right there, so the lunula. The nail body, it sits and is fused to the nail bed. Underneath, we have the hyponychium. And here you see um, the bone. And what can happen is if you smash your nail, blood can start to develop here and it can push up and damage that, uh, that nail bed and actually cause the nail to break loose. Um, so what they have to sometimes do is drill a little hole into the nail to relieve that pressure. Um, if you smash your finger a lot farther back, it can permanently distort that, that uh, nail as it grows back. Okay, burns. There are three classifications of burns. We have first degree burns, and that is just a partial thickness burn, and it affects the epidermis. Okay, stick your hand under some hot water, pull it away real quick, your hand's red and hurts a little bit, um, you know, but within a few minutes that redness is gone. Okay, that is a first degree burn. Second degree burn is going to reach down into the dermis. Think of blisters. If you get a blister, that's a second degree burn. Again, it's still a partial thickness burn. Then a full thickness burn, this is where you're going to be a Cripsy Critter, and that is a third degree burn. Let's take a look. You can see here, a uh, full thickness burn. So this is a third degree burn. Um, here, you've got, um, all of this looks like uh, second degree burns. If we go farther away, which we can't see in this picture, you're going to see varying degrees of these second degree and first degree burns. So is this third degree burn painful? Okay, actually it's not painful because you've totally singed off 
and destroyed all of those nerve endings. But if you have third degree burns, is it painful? Horrifically painful. That's because you don't have all just third degree burns. You have all these extremely painful second degree burns. I remember getting second degree burns on my legs one year um, when I was out kayaking in uh, California. Um, didn't have sunscreen on and had shorts on. I could tell toward the end of the kayaking session that I was in trouble. My legs were starting to hurt and swell up. Later that night, trying to get to the airport to uh, leave, I could hardly walk. For a few months, I had to walk with a cane because of um, the damage uh, from um, from the second degree burns. So they could be very debilitating. And this was probably 20 years ago, um, maybe less. No, around 20 years ago or so. Um, but um, um, I still have problems with my ankles after they swelled so bad from uh, from those burns. So with that said, these this is very painful. So even with third degree burns, which singe off all um, all the nerve endings, it's still horrifically painful. And there are different types of skin grafts. There's split skin skin grafts. This is where they take almost like a cheese uh, grater, not grater, but uh, cheese plane, I guess. And um, it's what you use to uh, slice off a real thin slice of cheese. Well, they have something like that will slice off very thin strips of skin, like off your thighs or buttocks. And then, um, then they can put little slits in that uh, piece of skin and expand it. There's also artificial skin that can be used temporarily until a skin graft is found to again help protect uh, from infection, loss of fluid and such. And also skin can come from cadavers. So that's one of the organs that can be actually donated. And um, you may not think of this, but what's the largest organ of the body? Largest organ of the body is your skin. Okay, and again, that is something that can be donated if you donate your organs. They're not going to take it all, so, you know, but they'll take strips, again, from the legs and what have you. And it can also come from uh, certain animals. Now, if you've ever listened to the news and they talk about maybe there's a fire and they'll say, oh, this person's been burned over... 20% of their body or 40% of their body. Well, how do they come up with these percentages? We have what's called the rule of nines. So the head is going to be 9% of the body. The upper limbs are also 9% of the body. Uh, the trunk is 18% for the front, 18% of the back. So what if just the chest were burned? Well, that's about half of the trunk, right? So that would be nine percent just the abdomen nine percent so nine and nine eighteen genitalia is about one percent lower limbs again each lower limb is about eighteen percent now if we're looking at kids um, we're going to have to change those percentages because kids have larger heads so that represents about fifteen percent upper limbs about 9%. The trunk is about 16% for the front, 16 for the back. Genitalia is still 1%, lower limbs, 17%. So again, kids have shorter legs, um, shorter bodies, bigger heads, uh, more proportionate arms. So Aging affects the skin. Um, the skin can become more easily damaged. Skin becomes drier as you age. Uh, functioning melanocytes decrease or increase, and you wind up with age spots, which I have a lot of. And uh, sunlight also ages skin more rapidly. 
Some clinical disorders, we have bacterial infections such as acne. Now, acne is basically plugged sebaceous glands and uh, that can be exacerbated hormonally. Um, but bacteria can get trapped in there as well. And that's where the bacterial infection uh, can come about. Other clinical disorders, we can have viral infections such as chickenpox. As you can see, this kid is covered with spots uh, because of chickenpox. And of course, chickenpox, once you've had it, that virus stays dormant in your nervous system. And if your immune system weakens for whatever reason or with age, it can come out of dormancy and then cause shingles. And again, shingles will cause little pustules to form. And uh, there's actually live virus within those pustules. So if you're around anyone with shingles, make sure you've been vaccinated for chickenpox or you've had chickenpox, which is still no guarantee that you're not going to get it. But just take precautions because there is live virus in those pustules. Okay, if we look at this little baby, he's got a skin rash. Now there's a lot of things that can cause skin rashes, including bacterial infections. Um, but if we look inside the mouth and we see these little white spots, those are called coplic spots. Coplic spots are what we say are pathognomonic for the German measles, for rubella. Okay, Pathognomonic just means we don't have to guess. If we see this particular um, sign, this particular thing, we know exactly what the diagnosis is. A lot of times, um, signs and symptoms are very vague, and a lot of different diseases can have the same signs and symptoms. But a pathognomonic sign is something, when you see it, you know exactly what the diagnosis is. And the fact that uh, this child has a rash inside the mouth will be these coplic spots. We know it's German measles. Okay. And if you look inside this baby's mouth and you see all these teeth, I'd be quite worried. Now, obviously, this picture is not inside of this baby's mouth. <laughs> but um, anyway, other clinical disorders, such as decubitus ulcers or bed sores. As you can see here, this is very poor nursing is what this is. This patient should be rotated and moved around and uh, taken off of these compression points. Right here is where the sacrum is. When the skin is very uh, thin, then the bone compresses the skin and cuts off the blood supply. When it does that, we say that the skin is ischemic. So that's poor blood supply. Then the skin is not going to get enough oxygen. So we say that the skin is hypoxic. And then eventually the skin dies. And we say that that is necrosis. So necrosis is death, tissue death. And you can see right here, again, this is where, what you sit on. Uh, it's your, the bones called the ischial tuberosities and um, it's compressing the skin. And once again, cutting off the uh, blood supply and creating these huge sores. I have had to take care of these on patients before and um, like this one here, you see how large it is? It's actually deeper underneath. Okay. And these have to, to uh, basically heal from the inside out and take a long time. Okay, skin cancers. Now, the first one is the basal cell uh, carcinoma. This right here is a basal cell carcinoma. Um, the one thing about basal cell carcinomas is they do not metastasize. They will keep growing and getting bigger, so they do have to be removed. But if they get into the bloodstream, the cells, they can't attach and, uh, and kind of make a new colony, which is what metastasis is, basically a new colony of, of uh, cancer cells. Um, so this is very treatable and should be taken care of when it's at its earlier stages. Here is a squamous cell carcinoma. Again, very treatable when caught early, but this one can metastasize. 
So it, it can be, um, I wouldn't say real aggressive, but it can metastasize and cause problems if not taken care of. And then here we have a malignant melanoma. This one can metastasize. It, it, it has a high likelihood of uh, metastasizing. And uh, again, it can be uh, taken care of. I've known people that have had very large melanomas removed, and that was probably oh, over 20 years ago, and they're doing fine. So again, this is something that can be treated, but it must be caught uh, pretty early. Okay. And with the melanoma, you want to know your ABCs if you're trying to identify this. A is going to be asymmetry. If we draw a line through the middle of this, one side is not going to look like the other side. It's very asymmetrical in its shape. B is borders. The borders are not nice and crisp. Okay, some of the, the color, some of the pigment kind of fades out into the skin almost like a stain. They call it a port wine stain. Okay. It would be like if you took a Sharpie and tried to make notes on a napkin. You're not going to get a nice crisp line. It's going to bleed into the the uh, napkin. Same with this. C is color. They tend to be highly pigmented. Um, you know, dark browns, blacks, purples. Okay. Um, Sometimes they can be clear, so that's that's kind of scary. But um, uh, they typically tend to be very um, pigmented because, remember, the melanocyte is what produces pigment. D is diameter. They say if it's the diameter of a pencil eraser, you should get it checked. Um, and then A, B, C, D, E is evolution. In other words, maybe it just starts off as looking like a freckle, and then you start to notice some changes and more coloration, um, color changes, the borders change, it becomes much larger. All of those point to, especially if they're all together, point toward uh, malignant melanoma.